This is Herb Kressel, editor of Radiology, and welcome to the May 2016 Radiology Podcast. This month, we have uh, uh, interviews with the authors of three uh, very stimulating uh, papers. First, I'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Matthew Davenport, assistant professor of radiology at the University of Michigan, who with his colleagues uh, authored a study entitled Indirect cost and harm attributable to a 13-hour inpatient corticosteroid prophylaxis prior to contrast-enhanced computed tomography. Uh, as you know, these uh, prophylactic uh, uh, corticosteroid uh, treatments are widely employed, and there have been questions about their overall value. I think readers will find this of interest. Next, I'll be speaking with Professor uh, Hilda Lamb of Leiden University in the Netherlands, who with his colleagues uh, in the Netherlands uh, authored a study entitled Association Between Hepatic Triglyceride Content and Left Ventricular Diastolic Function in a Population-Based Cohort, the NEO study. Uh, and this is a large population study looking at factors related to obesity and uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I think this uh, paper has some very provocative data, and I think people will find this interesting clinically, scientifically, and on a more general uh, level. And finally, uh, Dr. Dave Kalmas, deputy editor of uh, the journal for uh, neuroradiology, will be speaking with uh, Mike Vernoy, Associate Professor of Radiology and Epidemiology at University Medical Center in Rotterdam, also in the Netherlands, on uh, her paper entitled White Matter Degeneration in Aging, a Longitudinal Diffusion MRI Analysis. We see a lot of cross-sectional studies uh, on changes in diffusion tensors and the like. Uh, this is kind of an interesting look at uh, changes in diffusion over time in aging. And uh, many of us boomers will no doubt find uh, this uh, topic uh, of interest, uh, if not a bit depressing. So uh, we hope you enjoy this month's podcast. And uh, as always, welcome your feedback. Hi, this is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the Radiology Podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Davenport, who is still assistant professor of radiology at the University of Michigan, despite his many publications, I might add, and who with his colleagues at the University of Michigan has uh, authored a, a very provocative paper entitled Indirect Cost and Harm Attributed to Oral 13-Hour Inpatient Corticosteroid Prophylaxis Prior to Contrast-Enhanced Computed Tomography. Welcome, Dr. Davenport. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So this was a very uh, interesting topic, uh, but precisely uh, why did you and your colleagues decide to undertake this study? Was this kind of a homegrown question in a practical nature, or was this kind of a theoretical interest? I think it was a combination of both, to be honest with you. I mean, we, we've in our group have thought about steroid preps for a long time. Our steroid prep policy has evolved over the years as our clinical friends have said increasingly, we're, we're tired of prepping our patients for these off indications, things we don't think are necessarily risk for contrast. And over time, we've honed our policy down to basically only prepping people with a, who have a history of a prior contrast reaction. But even in that patient population, the evidence base is not very strong to do it. In fact, in other countries, um, it's not done at all. And the reason for it is that the evidence is supporting um, steroid prep to prevent uh, lethal reactions is weak, uh, and the number needed to treat is very high. And a recent publication that came from our group said that the number needed to treat uh, to prevent a lethal reaction was in the tens of thousands. Yeah. And so that got us thinking, you know, what is the effect really of doing this in an inpatient population where prepping someone might affect their length of stay? 
Okay, now, uh, ideally, I think one would do a prospective double-blind uh, study, but you and your colleagues use retrospectively collected data in part. Uh, how did you reduce the bias that one typically sees in this type of uh, retrospective study? Yeah, good question. I think doing a prospective study in this context is actually quite challenging because the signal we're trying to measure is very, very small. So the prospective double-blinded study, which have been done in the past, had a hard time showing an effect size in this exact kind of a scenario. So it's got some trouble. So retrospective data does have some advantages in that you can look at many, many, many patients in a very tightly defined cohort without all the costs associated. The way we reduced the bias was two different ways. One is um, we matched the two groups, people receiving a PrEP and not receiving a PrEP on the basis of their age, their sex, and the year the CT was performed. Uh, and then once we did that, we then looked at a series of um, a dozen or so important um, clinical risk factors or comorbid diseases that might predict whether someone would be in the hospital longer or a shorter period of time. And we found the rates of those were basically similar in all the different um, okay. groups. So they were matched uh, uh, for some demographics, but they were sort of had a reasonably equal distributions of relevant comorbidities that might affect length of stay. That's correct. You didn't seem to consider allergic history, minor reactions, things that you might be interested in. How come? Yeah, the major reason for that is that um, at our uh, hospital, the policy is to prep for certain indications. So if somebody was to have that indication, they would automatically be in the um, prepped group. And if they did not have the indication, they'd automatically by default be in the non-prepped group. So it'd be impossible really to control for that. Okay. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, you also used a hypothetical cohort. Uh, and uh, what did you try to study with this group of hypothetical patients? That's right. So we had two different approaches to this. One was looking at the actual uh, groups. What was their length of stay that may or may not be associated with the steroid prep? And then the other group was the hypothetical cohort. We said, based on what we learned from our study cohort, can we try to model what the cost would be on a population level uh, to try to prevent one reaction-related de death by using these steroid preps? And um, so they're sort of different different goals, but same topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, how were the underlying assumptions that drove the hypothetical analysis determined? Um, so we conducted a sensitivity analysis for our hypothetical cohort, and the purpose of that is to model the variability within a particular variable, which we don't necessarily know what the right answer is. So mm -hmm. let's say there's a publication that came out and said the risk of death from anaphylaxis is X, and another publication comes out and says, well, actually, I think it's Y. We can actually model that variation between those two estimates. So the way we did that was we looked at the published literature and the data from our uh, cohorts to mm -hmm. determine what the variable uh, should be. So, uh Tell us what you actually found. What, what were the key findings in your study? Um, I was actually surprised at the signal that we found in the data. I was expecting to see a minor blip maybe, but it was a pretty strong signal. We basically found that patients, inpatients who get a steroid prep, the 13-hour steroid prep, have a 25-hour median prolongation in the time from admission to CT, and they also have a 25-hour median prolongation in the time from admission to discharge. So they're spending a day and some change additional in the hospital um, associated with the presence of a steroid prep. And that was a big number to me. It's interesting those numbers are actually identical, that there was a 25-hour prolongation before the CT and the aggregate um, length of stay was 25 hours longer. Patients who got a prep actually tended to get discharged a little bit faster after the prep. Um, uh, compared to people who didn't get the prep after the CT, and I think that's because they were just tired of waiting around the hospital, basically. Um, and also, we found that patients who got a steroid prep had a higher infection rate, and we think the reason for that is that they had a longer length of stay. The um, infection rate per 1,000 hospital days was similar between the two groups, so we don't think it was an enriched or sicker population, but we think they were just in the hospital longer. And um, the hypothetical cohort showed that, um, as you'll see in figure four, that to try and prevent a death from contrast, in patients who have risk factors, who've had a history of a prior contrast reaction, you end up 
putting a lot in the tank. You spend a ton of money, you indirectly are associated with a lot of hospital acquired infections, and you indirectly are associated with a lot of hospital acquired infection related deaths. And in the sensitivity analysis, even in the best case scenario where you, where you uh, model the, the most therapeutic benefit from a PrEP and the least harm from a PrEP, the model still shows you kill three times as many people as you save by prepping this inpatient vulnerable population. And those numbers were surprising to me, but at the same time, maybe, maybe it's not surprising. So just to make it clear, the relationship between the corticosteroid uh, PrEP and the hospital-acquired infection is really mediated by the length of stay. There's no direct relationship between those two? My hypothesis, my hypothesis is that it has to do with the length of stay prolongation, but that's a guess, of course. It, I mean, it may be that there's some minor um, immunosuppression that occurs, but I think that's less likely to be true. Okay. Now, uh, what about the outpatients? You sort of mentioned as a study limitation that you didn't really consider them. Uh, can the results be extrapolated? A lot of this is length of stay related, so presumably if you did it in your home, you wouldn't have uh, that risk. And then how might this actually affect policy? Would, would you contemplate changing policy for inpatient but not for outpatients? Mm -hmm. Those are good questions. I think you cannot use any of the information that we have presented in this paper to um, make decisions about outpatients. They have a completely different set of risks. Being at your home, watching TV, or taking a walk outside does not have the same risks as laying in a hospital bed next to your neighbor who has MRSA. So they're just not really comparable populations. Uh, with regard to policy, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I guess I tend to be a little bit of a cynic, and I would say that this is not sufficient evidence necessarily to unilaterally change policy, but I think it's, it's uh, stimulating to me, it's interesting to me, and it certainly should propel further interest in this to maybe study it in a more rigorous way to see if the findings can be replicated. So, um, uh, at your institution, has the, these findings, have, has been, there been any movement to alter policy, or is this just kind of uh, uh, in the tank and uh, we'll see what happens? Yeah, I think um, we're still sort of recovering from the shock of the numbers, honestly. And um, I, I would not advocate changing policy at our hospital just on the basis of this. And I, the reason I say that is because it requires a lot to change policy. And the current ACR standard is to prep these patients. And the current United States standard of care is to prep these patients. And I think it'd be difficult to change a local policy without a concomitant change in national policy. I see. So let's, uh, for your final pithy question, let's cut to the chase. Uh, Dr. Davenport, if uh, unfortunately you were a, a patient in a hospital and had a prior reaction, uh, would you uh, decline uh, the corticosteroid prep based on what you know? So I'm going to give you a slightly nuanced answer. So if my history is a prior contrast reaction. I'm getting the same class of contrast medium, and my prior reaction was mild. I would decline the prep and say, just go grab an EpiPen and stand by. Okay. No prep. If I had a prior moderate or severe reaction, I might have a different thought about it. If my reaction was severe, I'd say, please don't give me contrast at all. I don't want to prep or the contrast. And if my prior reaction was moderate, I'd consider getting a prep first. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, uh, very thoughtful. Great to speak with you again, Dr. Davenport. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi, this is Herb Kressel, Editor of Radiology. And uh, today I'm joined uh, by Dr. Hildo J. Lamb, professor of radiology at the University of Leiden, who with his colleagues uh, from uh, Leiden and elsewhere, uh, published a fascinating study on the association between hepatic triglyceride content and left ventricular function in a population-based cohort the NEO study, and NEO stands for Netherlands Epidemiology of Obesity Study. Good day, Dr. Lamb. How are you? Hello, uh, Professor Kressel. Nice to see you. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the first question I'm sure on everyone's mind is, what is the Netherlands Epidemiology of Obesity Study? 
Uh, tell us about it. How many people are in it, and uh, how do you get to enroll? Can I join? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, indeed uh, an interesting question. Uh, the, the study is actually already uh, finished, so all the inclusions are completed. And in total, we had a complete uh, study population of more than 6,600 uh, patients. And that includes uh, people with normal weight, that was the smallest group, and also people with overweight and with uh, obesity. And we uh, defined this based on the uh, WHO criteria. So for us, normal weight was a BMI of 25 below. Uh, the overweight was between 25 and uh, 30. Uh, kilogram per square meter and uh, obesity was more than uh, 30 uh, as BMI and from all these uh, thousands of patients uh, we could not all uh, put them in the in the MRI machine it's uh, too costly and uh, logistically uh, really complicated so we had a subgroup of 1200 uh, patients entering uh, the MR machine and because of uh, technical reasons and of splitting in uh, measuring the brain and the cardiovascular aspects in different patients, uh, and we excluded also uh, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, and uh, use of alcohol and statins, we ended up in the end with uh, more than uh, 700 patients who entered the database for, uh, for this study. Okay, good. Now, uh, just to go back, uh, in the, the larger study, what happened to those people once they were enrolled? Were they just monitored or did they have any intervention or what was measured? Yeah, it, it, it was set up as a cross-sectional study, so they were all measured at one moment in time. And the idea was to perform a, a real basic uh, epidemiologic uh, study. Uh, and what we do now, because it is already in follow-up for four to five years, is that we do a clinical follow-up. So we have one measurement, including all kinds of things, but also neurologic testing, blood samples, but also MRI of the brain, cardiovascular system, even of the knee in some subgroups. And the idea is to follow them up uh, clinically. So uh, check for events, check for new disease, for treatments, and, mm -hmm. and, but there is no additional imaging uh, planned on those. I see. So, uh, and before we get into the study in a little more depth, can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cardiovascular disease? Yeah, that, that's actually one of the main uh, topics we are uh, researching now, and also in, in other groups, research groups, there's now a lot of interest in that topic, the relation between liver fat and cardiovascular function. And uh, of course, yeah, we don't know exactly what the relation explains, but we have some, some ideas. Actually, we think that the liver plays a central role in our uh, lipid metabolism, as already known in the past, but that the liver is also directing the delivery of fat to uh, organs. So we call that uh, ectopic, uh, ectopic liver uh, co uh, content. And, uh, for example, um, in the vessel wall, in the heart itself, and in other organs, like the kidney, uh, there can be liver accumulation. And the idea is that... You mean liver or you mean lipid accumulation? Yeah, just uh, the, the lipid accumulation, okay. for example, in the heart. And the idea is that it uh, leads to uh, inflammatory processes, to metabolic changes, uh, switch to, uh, for example, uh, lipid metabolism, mm -hmm. and that all these factors combined lead to, for example, in the heart, to reduced uh, myocardial perfusion, increased stiffness of the muscle due to fibrosis or diffuse fibrosis. And now the link between the liver and the heart is that we think that we have first fat accumulation in the heart, then you have a sort of inflammatory process leading to diffuse fibrosis, which leads to uh, functional abnormalities. I see. So uh, then in this particular study, uh, what specifically did you hope to learn? Well, based on this idea of the diffuse fibrosis that we did not directly measure, we wanted to find a sort of clinical outcome of that process, and that is actually a diastolic function. And diastolic function also gets a lot more attention uh, in the past few years.
because the interesting thing is that when you see subtle changes, subclinical changes in diastolic heart function, uh, then you can still reverse the damage. So that's why we were interested in the relation between liver fat and diastolic heart function, because when you can detect diastolic dysfunction in an early stage, we can apply therapy to uh, reverse the pathology. Now, uh, how did you, uh, I guess you alluded to this a little bit, but how did you actually determine the sample size uh, for this study? And did you think it was well-powered when you began? Now, actually, when we started, we were aiming at the overweight and obese uh, category. So it, it actually was determined as a BMI of uh, 27 uh, kilogram per square meter and higher uh, to include. But when the study proceeded, uh, we also uh, like to include sort of normal weight group. And that group was a little bit underpowered um, because, uh, yeah, it was added on later and we had a sort of standard uh, time frame for the study to be completed. But the total sample size uh, of the overweight uh, patients was actually based on uh, blood measurements and all the other uh, measurements we do, like the neurologic testing and all the clinical status. So that's why we ended up with a couple of thousand studies in the total study. And based on our uh, experience with the uh, standard deviations on the MRI measurements, we could decide to lower the number of MRI examinations to a more reasonable number to scan in, in a few years. I see. So uh, what specifically did you do in your study uh, and what did you find? Yeah, what we did, uh, and that is uh, nicely uh, depicted actually in, uh, in figure two, uh, is that we measured uh, the fat of the liver using MR spectroscopy. Uh, that was a single volume measurement uh, at a sort of standardized location in the liver. And what we did there is that we acquired uh, just a water spectrum without suppression. So then you measure the water content of the liver in that certain area. Mm -hmm. And after that, we applied the same acquisition, but then with water suppression. And with that technique, you actually zoom in to the fat signal. Mm -hmm. And if you then def uh, divide the fat signal by the water signal, you get a relative uh, fat percentage of the liver in that area. And what you see in the, in the figure two is that on the left side, on the top, you see a typical spectrum of a normal weight uh, volunteer. Uh, you see very high water and very low fat signal, that is the, the back row. And when this is quantified, in this example, the, the fat content was uh, about 1.5%. So that is completely normal. We consider a fat percentage below 5.5% uh, as normal. And then in the middle, uh, you see a patient with overweight. There you still have a normal fat percentage in the liver, but it's higher. It's now uh, about 3.5% uh, fat. And on the top row uh, on the right, you see a patient with uh, obesity. And there we see a fat percentage of 7%. So that is really a fatty liver. And the other measurement was based on uh, flow imaging with uh, MRI, uh, flow imaging across the mitral valve uh, in the heart. And there you can measure the, the way the heart fills. So actually how the heart fills is in an early wave that is uh, sort of passive filling because you have a pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So the blood enters the left ventricle passively. And that's the, uh, the early filling wave. And the second filling wave that's called by, uh, caused by atrial contraction. So that's an active process. And we know that in, in a lot of uh, diseases, uh, you have a compensatory mechanism that when the heart becomes stiffer because of fibrosis, for example, maybe based on, uh, on fat and inflammation uh, uh, in that respect, then you have a change. Then the early filling goes down because the heart is stiffer, so it cannot relax fully, so the heart enters not so well. But then the atrial contraction becomes more important. So what we calculate is the E over A ratio, the ratio between the early and atrial filling. And then on the bottom row in figure two, you can see that in the, the normal weight uh, volunteers, you see that the E wave is higher than the A wave. It was actually quantified as uh, 1.3 as the EA ratio. 
But then on the other uh, end of the spectrum on the right, in the obese patients, we see an E over A ratio of about 1.1. So then the E wave is almost similar as the A wave. So it shows that the heart is compensating for the yeah, what we think is the difference in compliance, the elasticity of I the see. left ventricle changes. And Good. that is actually accompanied also by an increase in, in fat content in the liver. Okay, so um, now if, if I understood this correctly, uh, you found that the hepatic triglyceride content was associated with diastolic function independent of other confounding factors, including the metabolic syndrome in the obese individuals, but not necessarily in the other uh, weight groups. Uh, what is the likely explanation for this? Yeah, we think that this is mainly related to, the, to a power problem. Okay. Uh, and that relates to the design of the study because we started with a inclusion of BMI 27 or higher. Got and it. actually there was the most emphasis. So actually, yeah, we cannot say anything about the overweight and the normal weight group. We need more subjects. There. Okay, so it's almost like you have a part A and a part B of your study. The part B is the yeah. obesity and that's better powered and uh, the relationship is clearer. Now, uh, you know, I, it, it occurred to me, uh, you used MR spectroscopy, which is a very recognized a reference standard. Could you have used IDEAL or one of the uh, imaging uh, tests to develop the fat fraction? Would that have been as useful or do you need to look at the specific fat types? No, that, that's really an interesting question. Uh, why we use spectroscopy in this study is more uh, a historical reason because we started doing this, uh, well, the idea originated in 2006 and actually nice. started scanning in 2008. And at that time, the, for example, Dixon techniques were not so developed yet. Uh, we were also trying to validate the technique uh, at that time. You see. Uh, but uh, for future studies, indeed, these uh, fat fraction imaging techniques are very interesting because what we measured now is just one small location in the liver, but actually we cannot tell anything about the heterogeneity of right, the, of the right. fat distribution in the liver. So that, that's indeed very interesting for, uh, for future work. And I also note that uh, you had a failure rate in the MR spectroscopy of around 10%, uh, which seems, well, certainly if you're doing sort of the Dixon-type techniques, uh, it should be much, much lower than that. What were some of the problems in this, collecting the spectroscopy data? Yeah, that, that's mainly related to the, the setup of the study. Uh, we scanned those patients in a 1.5T mobile MRI scanner that was hired for the study uh, and it was scanned by regular MR technicians. So uh -huh. in the beginning we were training them for uh, the functional imaging and all the standard imaging for the brain and the knee and the heart and the vessels and spectroscopy is quite hard for them to learn. So actually yeah. the 10% the problems were in the beginning of the study. I see. That's learning curve issues. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, in the discussion of your paper, you note the results of other groups, and actually your results are somewhat discrepant to a number of studies that you uh, referenced done in Asia. Do you think this is, again, a sampling size issue, or might there be other differences in the Asian population that might account for some of the differences? Yeah, I think th this is also a very interesting point. Uh, of course, we have the, the sampling uh, issue between all the different studies, but actually we are also performing now other studies in uh, other subgroups. For example, we are now working on a study in uh, Hindustani, and the first results show that indeed they have different type of fat distribution throughout the body. So maybe there can also be a difference in, in different populations. Hmm. Uh, also, for example, as shown in the MESA study, they observe different normal values for even uh, simple measures like ejection fraction uh, and diastolic volumes. So this is, this is also very interesting to compare different uh, populations and define normal values for specific groups of patients. Right. Well, this seems like an incredibly uh, important and fascinating research area. Uh, for your group, 
it sounds like the NEO study is sort of uh, closed up. What do you think are the important next steps uh, for research in this area? Yeah, what, what we will try to do, but that's uh, a challenge uh, for uh, to finance the whole uh, program. But actually, we are now setting up uh, a NEO 2.0 uh, study. Yeah. What we would like to do there is based on these uh, measurements, uh, we would like to do all measurements in all patients now. So in the meantime, we had a lot of uh, technical advancements, for example, uh, the new fat fraction uh, imaging techniques, which speed up the acquisition. Also, we can now do uh, total body fat distribution measurements. Uh, we can also do many other things to measure in the liver and heart function, diffuse fibrosis and all the newer techniques. So what we try to do now is uh, perform all these scans uh, of the heart and the whole cardiovascular system in a new uh, batch. And the uh, interesting thing is that, of course, we then have a follow-up of the patients who were already in the uh, 1.0 uh, NEO study. Okay. Well, this is really interesting stuff. Uh, thank you for your paper and for joining us in the discussion today. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, explain the details. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Kalmus. I'm Deputy Editor for Neuroradiology. Today I'm joined by Micah Varnoyes, uh, who is Associate Professor of Radiology and Epi Epidemiology at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. She is here to talk about her paper, White Matter Degeneration in Aging, a Longitudinal Diffusion MRI Analysis. Welcome, Dr. Varnoyes. Thank you, Dr. Kalmus. Thanks for the invitation to talk about our paper. Sure, and before you start, give us just a thumbnail sketch of the Rotterdam study. Sure. Um, well, the setting in which he conducted this study is indeed in the setting of the Rotterdam study, which is a large population-based cohort study among middle-aged and elderly participants. They all originate from the same suburb in uh, the town of Rotterdam. Um, the entire Rotterdam study consists of close to 15,000 people and it has been running since 1990. And the main aim of the study is to study causes and consequences of age-related diseases. And among those, neurological diseases are one of the main topics that we're studying. And then mainly the neurological diseases that are very frequent occurring in older age, so stroke and dementia. Uh, what we do in the Rotterdam study is we follow people um, uh, we invite them to our research center, we um, do an entire checkup with interviews, medical examination, um, and then we follow them every three to four years um, for change in a set of biomarkers that we assess, and we also continuously follow them for occurrence of uh, major events. And in 2005, we incorporated in the core of the study protocol um, uh, brain imaging. We uh, have a dedicated research scanner with dedicated research technologists who scan every participant who comes to the research center. So right now we have um, over 5,000 unique baseline scans in our participants and up to 3,500 people have had longitudinal imaging. And um, the, our imaging protocol uh, consists of uh, structural scanning and a bit of functional scanning. Uh, it also includes resting state fMRI. And for the structural scanning, we do T1 weighted imaging, T2 weighted and flare imaging to look at brain tissue volumes and white matter lesion uh, volumes. Uh, but we also have uh, a diffusion tensor imaging sequence in the protocol to study microstructural change in uh, white matter. And that is what the current uh, paper mainly focuses on. Um, and the specific aim of the current paper was to see, um, to study longitudinal change in diffusion properties of the white matter over a two-year time period. And we did this in a set of participants in a Rotterdam study in whom we had longitudinal data, longitudinal DTI data at that point, uh, which is in a little over 500 participants um, with a mean age of close to 70 years. Um, I think the age range was, yes, yeah, 64 to 91 years. And we mainly studied fractional anisotropy, so the, the degree of directionality of diffusion along white matter tracts, and mean diffusivity, which is... Um, uh, uh, which is mainly the uh, degree of displacement of um, the water molecules um, um, perpendicular to the tract. Um, 
and um, we did what, this. What were, your, what were your major findings from these 500 longitudinal studies? Yes, we um, assessed these diffusion property changes both globally, so over the entire white matter and voxel-wise. And I think, well, our main result is that when we um, looked at these changes over two years' time, we saw that a widespread in the white matter, we saw that uh, both FA decreased and MD increased, both of which reflect a worse microstructural integrity of the white matter, um, which is um, something that we um, could expect, but that was all based on cross-sectional studies because up to now the main work of other studies in uh, using diffusion tensor imaging has been done cross-sectional, also in aging, in which we saw that with increase in age the white matter um, uh, structural integrity decreases. Um, but this was hardly uh, shown in a longitudinal setting, which is very important because um, uh, in the cross-sectional setting we only look at accumulated change and we want to see how in a short time period um, these changes occur and whether you could really uh, capture them and potentially use also in a clinical setting and to understand, um, uh, to be able to monitor white matter changes over time. So we see that even over a relatively short time period, we see that there's widespread changes, which I can show if we look at figure two in the manuscript. This is actually showing us the, um, the main finding with change in FA and MD over time. In the top row, we see how FA changes over time, and the red color indicates regions where FA decreases um, over the two-year time period. And in the bottom row, we see uh, mean diffusivity MD change over time, and the blue color indicates the increase in MD. And as we can see, and these are all, um, this is uh, projected on a white matter skeleton as used in track-based spatial statistics. That's a method that uh, people working with DCA, DTI data are very familiar with. Um, so this essentially shows the, the core of the white matter um, skeleton and the center of the tracks. And as we can see, um, very widespread over the center of these tracks are the changes in FA and MD. Um, what is very, um, what we should note here is that these are changes in normal appearing white matter. So this was norm white matter that appeared completely normal at baseline. So we excluded all the white matter uh, lesion voxels that were present at baseline. Uh, what is furthermore of, uh, noticeable is that, or is important to stress, is that um, these changes were apparent and were significant even after we adjusted for the amount of white matter atrophy and white matter lesion uh, volume that people had. So these are more what we often call macrostructural markers of white matter disease. And when we adjusted for these, we still found these microstructural changes. So that means that above and beyond these macrostructural changes, you can really measure these microstructural changes over time. Uh, well, another thing that I would like to note in uh, figure two is that even the, so the red color shows the decrease in FA, so that's the direction that you would expect, and a decrease in integrity in the white matter, but we see some small blue areas in the top row, um, and that indicates that there's an increase in FA over time in these areas, which seems very paradoxical because we would expect, of course, that there's only um, a deterioration in white matter over time. But it is less paradoxical if we realized um, how FA is measured. And FA indicates the directionality of water diffusion in voxels. Um, but of course, we know that white matter tracks in the brain um, can cross. And there's actually many, many crossing tracks in the brain. Um, and if in a voxel, in a particular voxel, two tracks cross within that voxel, and only one of the tracks, so then in that voxel, the entire FA for that voxel is averaged over these two tracks. But if only one of these tracks um, deteriorates over time and the other track is preserved, we can measure a sort of paradoxical increase in FA because that one uh, track that is preserved has a much stronger directionality suddenly than the average of the two tracks in the voxel. And that is probably what we see happening here because um, if we look at those blue voxels in the top row, we see that they are mainly present in the area where we expect the um, corticospinal tract and the motor fibers to, uh, to run through. We see it very neatly in um, the centrum semiovale, in the uh, internal capsule, um, 
And of course, we can understand that um, one of the tracks that probably is preserved quite late until in life is um, the corticospinal tract. So probably the paradoxical increase in FA that we see here is resulting from this um, crossing fiber phenomenon and, um, and the preservation of the corticospinal tract. Um, which is supported by the fact that in this corticospinal tract we do see an increase in MD as we see in the bottom row. So we do see that um, the entire diffusivity increases but it's just the directionality that becomes a bit more stronger in one direction compared to um, another direction. Mm -hmm. And were you able to correlate this with, with patients' age? Do you have enough of a spread in, in age to, to look at the impact of age um, on the, the temporal findings? Yes, so another finding uh, that we did on top of this is if we looked at patients' age, we saw that there was a nonlinear effect of age on uh, the uh, loss of microstructural integrity in the white matter. And we saw that particularly people at old age um, had a steeper decline in white matter integrity. Um, which may be not of a big surprise, but it hasn't been shown before um, because this was something that we could not uh, study in cross-sectional designs. And it is important because it could indicate, or it indicates that up to high age, the white matter um, loss is probably more pronounced than younger age, and it uh, making this a very important time window to still try to preserve this white matter. So the change is accelerating over time? Yes, they're accelerating over time, yeah. yeah, so there's effect modification by age, yeah. And you also looked at potential risk factors such as cardiovascular risk factors and the impact on the microstructure? Yes, indeed. We looked at um, several cardiovascular risk factors, among which blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, cholesterol level, and we also included BMI, and we also included um, uh, APOE genotype being the most important risk factor for um, dementia. And surprisingly, um, we found hardly any associations um, between these risk factors and the loss of microstructural integrity, um, which might be explained by a couple of factors. One might be that the time interval, two years, might be relatively short um, to really find these changes, so we, so we might have been a bit underpowered. Um, another Potential explanation is, as I've shown in figure two, is that we mainly looked at tract centers and we used this white matter skeleton. And it might be that the uh, tract centers are less um, affected by cardiovascular um, factors and it, the changes might occur more in the tract periphery. But I think the most important explanation actually is that um, we, um, we know, of course, from previous studies that cardiovascular risk factors have an effect on white matter. We know that all these risk factors that I just mentioned lead to white matter atrophy, lead to white matter lesions. So it is surprising that we don't find something with white matter uh, structural integrity. Um, but the most important explanation probably is that um, all of those cross-sectional results look at um, accumulated change over the lifespan and then um, look at one time point and then find, for example, that hypertension relates to white matter lesion volume. Whereas we didn't look at all the, we didn't look at this association with the baseline, but we only looked at the change over time over a very short period. And potentially this change is just smaller in relation to the whole accumulated change up to that point. And you say you also looked at APOE uh, uh, risk factors as well. What did you find there in terms of cog cognition and, and white matter microstructure? Yeah, so we, with APOE, we also had a surprising result. We found, um, um, we found no um, um, loss of microstructural integrity over time in persons with the APOE4 genotype, but we paradoxically found um, um, actually some regions where they um, seem to have um, a decrease in mean diffusivity, meaning um, uh, less loss of microstructural integrity versus non-carriers. But when we looked at this more closely, uh, we found that when we looked at the baseline um, um, results and the baseline uh, DTI measures in APOE4 carriers versus non-carriers, we found that the APOE4 carriers actually had higher MD and lower FA, so worse microstructural integrity compared to the non-carriers. So um, even though we didn't, we, they seem to be doing a bit better over the two-year time follow-up, their start was worse. So that might indicate that um, their um, brain damage caused by the APOE4 genotype probably had already occurred uh, before we started to follow them up. So that might mean that 
that damage already occurs earlier in life, so that later in life they have um, seemingly less damage compared to, um, to the non-carriers, which might also relate a bit to a healthy selection or a healthy survivor bias that perhaps the persons with ApoE4 genotype in our study, it, it being a population-based study, might have been a bit healthier relatively compared to the non-carriers. Did you correlate any clinical or neuro neuropsychological outcomes with the imaging findings? Uh, not in the present study, but um, as in the entire Rotterdam study, one of our um, outcome measures is cognitive function and cognitive change. We also, um, we have done in the past and we are currently performing uh, studies looking at the relation between DCI measures and uh, cognitive function. What we found in the past when we looked globally for the entire white matter, we found that um, FA and MD in the entire white matter relates to um, cognitive function with people with a lower FA and higher MD having a worse cognitive function. And again, this is on top of and beyond the uh, present white matter atrophy and white matter lesions. Um, what we are currently also doing is looking at specific white matter tracts to see whether, because the white matter of course is not an entire bulk substance, but um, is um, actually divided into um, functional uh, different tracts and how these relate to cognitive functioning. Um, and we see again, quite similar to what we've shown in the present manuscript, that a widespread, um, um, uh, there's a widespread loss of um, white matter structure that relates to cognitive functioning. So there's many tracks that contribute to the cognitive decline over age. And I think if we um, think about how we can use the results for the present paper um, and translate them more to a clinical, um, to a clinical setting, for example. Um, what we show in the present paper is particularly the uh, magnitude of um, uh, the microstructural changes in the white matter over time. But these can be the basis to, um, for example, define what is normal because it's very hard. We understand it to a certain extent, for example, what a normal volume of the hippocampus is and we use that measure, that biomarker in clinical practice. Um, but for a new measure like uh, microstructure integrity, uh, we are in need of reference values and of an understanding of what is normal in order to be able to translate that to an individual person um, and decide whether his or her change over time or an ac acceleration of white matter um, uh, microstructural um, damage is, um, is in line with what we expect um, adjusted for age and sex or whether it's, um, it's more pronounced. Well, uh, well, thank you for your time today, and congratulations on a fantastic paper. Um, we look forward to, uh, to more papers from your excellent group going forward. Thank you very much.